Hi, and welcome to Lecture 7 of 3032 and 7079 EDN on Lesson Planning, Differentiation and Assessment. In this lecture, we're going to cover these learning objectives. So by the end, you should be able to identify and justify the key parts of a lesson plan. You should be able to write learning objectives using cognitive verbs, construct things that we call success criteria and explain the link they have to the learning objective. You should be able to create differentiated success criteria using the three-star system. You should be able to identify non-fiction text structures using a piece of text. And finally, summarise a given piece of text using the correct pictorial representation of that text. Okay? So let's have a look at lesson planning first. Now, if there's one thing for you to get out of today's lecture is that failing to plan is planning to fail. You must, must always plan your lessons when you're on practicum. Now, the thing is, when you eventually get out, that, out there on practicum, is that you'll find that your mental teacher won't be doing the same level of lesson planning that you're doing. That's because they've got at least five years of experience under their belt, whereas you have virtually zero years of teaching under your belt. So for them, all of their lesson planning exists virtually within vaults inside their head that they can just pull on um, to use at any time they wish. You, on the other hand, will be required to create actual lesson plans, physical lesson plans on paper, number one, so that you've actually thought about it in your head and, and committed it to paper, but also so that your mentor can check. Eventually, over time, you will get to that same stage as your mentor in having a whole bunch of lesson plans in your head all ready to go, so you don't, you're not constantly lesson planning the night before. So, one of the key texts that's going to help you plan lessons is this text by Wiggins and McTighe, which they call Understanding by Design. Now, this is not a new concept, um, because it's also known by names as backward designing or backward mapping. And it can be broken down into four easy steps where you identify the desired result. What do you eventually want to achieve out of this lesson, out of this week, out of this unit of work? And we're going to be practicing doing that by writing what we call WALTs. The second step is to determine the assessment evidence or writing what we call WILFs is another name for that. Number three is selecting your lesson structure that you're going to use to obviously structure the lesson. And then four, eventually going about planning the activities. How are you going to encourage active learning during the lesson? What questions are you going to use to scaffold thinking? What are you going to be doing? What are the students are going to be doing? All of that information goes into a lesson plan. So let's go through each one of those steps. Step number one is identifying the desired result. Now, in this lecture and also out in the field, you'll co commonly come across this term WALT or WALTS. And that's an acronym which stands for We Are Learning Too. These are also called learning objectives or learning intent. So if you hear those three terms, just understand that they're actually talking about the same thing. These define what you want students to know, feel or do. Now in more technical terms, what we're talking about is what do you want students to uh, do cognitively, affectively, so their feelings, or behaviourally, what skills do you want them to, to have. Now generally, we will create cognitive learning objectives or behavioural learning objectives because in schools we generally, most of the time, deal with content or skills. Sometimes we deal with attitudes and there are subjects out there which deal with the affective more effectively than math and science do. But just know that there are three broad categories that you can write learning objectives about. Now, when you are writing your learning objective, you should stick to one or two maximum per lesson. Now I noticed how we had quite a few learning objectives at the beginning of this PowerPoint. That's because you're at university, you are doing your masters or you're doing your undergraduate and you are what we considered in society as expert learners. You've jumped through all the hoops of primary school and high school and you've demonstrated that you're able to consume knowledge at quite a high rate. That's why we have that many learning objectives. However, when you're a high school teacher, at most you will have one or two 
learning objectives per lesson. So just keep it to, to a minimum. Those learning objectives, they'll either be based upon the Australian curriculum, so mathematics, science, history, geography, whatever it is, or it can be based upon a school-based document, such as a work program or a unit, uh, or a unit plan. Either way, your learning objectives are already predetermined either by the government in terms of the Australian curriculum or by a head of curriculum or a head of department in terms of unit plans and work programs. Okay? Rightio, so this is the way that Waltz, Wilfs and a third category, a third thing called TIBS. So in some schools they'll refer to them as Waltz, Wilfs and TIBS. So you'll see that generally whenever we write a lesson we will start with our learning objectives we will include something else that we call the success criteria and in some schools there's a requirement that you tell the students why you are learning a particular piece of content and that's the purpose of the TIBS. Okay? So notice in this instance within this theoretical lesson you're being asked to identify and justify the elements of a lesson plan you're being asked to explain the relationship between these elements and then finally creating a list of the top 10 principles of lesson planning. We'll talk more later on about the explicit relationship that learning objectives and success criteria should have. Now, when you're writing your learning objectives, we use things called either, you'll, heard, you'll hear them referred to either as either Bloom's verbs or cognitive verbs. Now, this is a graphic that I've just taken off the internet and it's a nice list of different verbs that you can use to start your learning objectives. Notice how at the beginning of the PowerPoint, the learning objectives were clearly stated and they're clearly stated in this instance as well. Notice also how the part of speech which kicks off these learning objectives is a verb, identify, justify, explain and create. That's really, really important. Now, one caveat to that is try and avoid, actually, <coughs> don't just avoid it, just don't do it at all, but don't use the word understand as your cognitive verb because it's, it, it's too nebulous. You can't really nail it down. What we're going for here is verbs which actually produce a product. So to reiterate, if you feel the urge to use the word understand as your, as your cognitive verb, then just replace it with explain or justify and you'll be fine. So now it's your turn. Practice writing a learning objective. So what I'd like you to do is to choose a mathematical, um, order of operations, types of triangles, solving quadratic equations, or scientific concept, such as those that you can see on the screen, and have a go at writing a single learning objective. Remember, start with the cognitive verb and make sure that it's not the word understand. Once you have your learning objective, the next thing to do is to write your success criteria or WILFs is what they're sometimes called in the field, which stands for what I'm looking for is. Now, when you're writing your success criteria, the more smart your success criteria are, the better, the more effective they'll be. So the more specific they are, the more measurable they are, attainable, relevant and time bound, the more effective they will be in measuring what success looks like in that particular lesson. So for example, good examples are what you can see on the screen. By the end of the lesson, the time bound, you will have successfully answered 10. So that's the measurable, so you can actually physically count 10. And in terms of the attainable, you make a judgment on the spot about the amount of time you have left in the lesson or, uh, or, and the ability of your students. So in this instance, the teacher has decided that 10 is well within the abilities of the students and self-corrected. So you can see how it's quite specific in terms of the requirements of what successfully completed 10 looks like. Two digit by two digit multiplication problems. There again, you can see how specific it is. And there are two more examples of good, smart success criteria. On the other hand, ineffective success criteria are examples that you can see on the bottom of the screen there. So for example, by the end of the lesson, you will understand the water cycle. Well, so what? 
you know, I, I understand is not a measurable thing. Do you want them to write a paragraph? Do you want them to draw a diagram? Do you want them to be able to record a, a two-minute explanation about the water cycle? Um, the next example there you can see is you'll be able to multiply. That would be the ineffective success criteria of the, example, of the first example that we looked at just before. Or you'll know about solids. Well, what, what do you want them to know about solids? Um, and, and how much? So the more detail you can provide to your students, the more clear it is to both you and your students about what constitute successful learning in that particular episode. Now, another good way to think about WALTs or success criteria is that they need to be SMIRCs. So this acronym is Specific, Measurable, Realistic. And what I particularly like about it is this kids speak because success criteria is ultimately for the student to self-assess whether they've successfully met the objectives of the lesson. So there's a good example, uh, a non-example and a good example of what success criteria should look like. So for example, not kids speak would be deconstruct all literary elements of the narrative. Now, to a lot of students, that would be quite bamboozling, whereas to us teachers would actually understand what literary elements are, what a narrative is, whereas we'd have to go into great detail about what those things mean for the students to fully understand whether they got the lesson or not. However, if you had written, I write about the characters, plot, themes and metaphors of the story. They are the literary elements. I have a minimum of two paragraphs on each. And so that defines the size and the scope of the level of understanding that you'll require from students. So there are some good examples of success criteria and bad examples of success criteria. Now, your success criteria and your learning objectives aren't just some random statements that you put into a lesson plan. They're actually intimately tied to one another. So your success criteria should not only be crystal clear to the students what you expected to see or hear um, as a result of the lesson, but it also is intimately tied back to our learning objectives. So you can see here, the learning objective is about multiplying two digit by two digit, and the success criteria is also about multiplying two digit by two digit numbers. It's, there's a one to one link between your success criteria and your learning objective. Now it's your turn. So earlier in this episode, you had a go at writing a learning objective. Now have a look at that learning objective and see if you can write good a good smart success criteria or WILF for that particular learning objective. Welcome back. The third thing, after you've identified the desired end result, number two, you have determined the success criteria, number three is to select a lesson structure. Now, within science, there are a whole range of lesson structures that we can use. So for example, we can use a POE or predict, observe, explain. Now that's just a fancy education way of saying we're doing a demonstration. Okay? And doing demonstrations have a range of, of pros and cons, which we're not really going to get into this lesson, but it's certainly a way that you can structure a lesson through a whole host of demonstrations. What you can also do is there's another pedagogical structure called explicit instruction. We're going to talk more about that late, later. And you use this particular structure if you're going to teach content within the sciences or skills within science, maths, in particular HPE or, or music, for example. And explicit instruction is quite a common pedagogical or coaching methodology which has been used for millennia in sports and music and it's just making its way into mathematics and science. Another lesson structure that you can use is inquiry. Now, when people say inquiry, people automatically think of experiments or investigations, and that's exactly what we're looking at here when we're talking about science. Now, there's a particular type of inquiry model called the five E's, and that was developed by Roger Bybee and his colleagues in 2005, and that's one that is used quite commonly within the sciences. 
And last but not least is the lecture. And the lecture is quite a common type of lesson structure which can be used. Now, when and where you'll use these particular le lecture structures will depend upon a whole variety of factors that we'll talk about in a moment. But let's talk about explicit instruction because that's one of going to be the key focus in this lecture. Now, explicit instruction is, as the name implies, that you are explicitly instructing students about a particular piece of content or a particular piece or a particular skill. And one of the ways that you'll quite hear, and one of the ways that you'll hear it commonly referred to in the field is by the little saying which goes, I do, we do, they do, you do. So I'll repeat that. It goes, I do, we do, they do, you do. Now, another name for this is the gradual release of responsibility. So at the beginning of the lesson, it's quite teacher-centered, it's quite teacher-focused. You are explicitly teaching a particular type of skill or a particular content, piece of content. Over the course of the lesson, through guided instruction and then collaboration between students, what you're doing is you're gradually releasing the responsibility of learning over to students. So less about you and more about students because the ultimate goal of this methodology is to provide an, a, a good model of what the final product looks like. So that's you modeling that particular piece of that particular skill and eventually students then learning how to do that skill independently. So for example, if you played music, that might be your music teacher playing the scale for the very first time before you have a go at it. Or if you play a sport, that might be your coach demonstrating a particular skill before you practice it as a whole team and then you might go and practice it again independently at home. But either way, the, 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 the responsibility of who is doing the most amount of work transfers from the student, from the teacher, eventually over time, to the student. And this is what we call explicit instruction. The focus later on in this lecture is actually showing you how to apply this particular pedagogical strategy to the science classroom. So, when it comes to planning a lesson and deciding upon the lesson structure, there we can break it down into a flow diagram like you can see on the screen. So, the first decision that you need to make is decide what type of lesson this is. Is this a content lesson or is it a practical lesson where, where, where you want students to, to do an experiment? If it is a content lesson, then the next decision to make is, well, how much time do you have? If you don't have a lot of time, then that's when lecture really comes into its own. Okay? So that's where you are standing at the front, it's very teacher-centered, and it's all about the dissemination of information. Okay? And there's very little information coming back from the students, or very little dialogue coming back from the students. If, however, if you do have time, and this is the route that I definitely recommend that you try and go down, is that if you do have time, what you then should try and do is determine the text structure, we'll talk more about that later on, and then pair that use of the text structure with explicit instruction that I do, we do, you do idea that I just spoke about. If, however, you have a practical lesson, then you have a number of choices there. So, if you're pressed for time, or if safety is an issue, or if the cost of equipment or is an issue, or if you don't want students breaking the equipment, then you might use a short demonstration. You use a demonstration, but then you pair that with predict, observe, explain, and then that way you up the intellectual demand of the activity and it being less of a show where you're up the front doing whiz-bang stuff with your students and more about the students engaging on an intellectual with the demonstration. Your other options after that are if you have a long practical or if you have a short practical. And you can read about those there. But for this particular lecture, we really want to focus on how you deliver content lessons when you have a good amount of time to cover that. So one of our key tools for covering content lessons 
is understanding what's called non-fiction text structures. So when we look at non-fiction, so that's factual pieces of text, they are written according to five basic structures. This is in the English language. So when we write books, when we write paragraphs, when we produce videos, we generally use one of these structures in English. We can describe and create the text in either a cause and effect, okay? that's showing cause and effect, or we can describe the sequence of events or list or order sequence, sorry. Or we can talk about problem solution, or we can talk about compare and contrasting, where we're looking for similarities and differences. And the last thing that we can structure text is by listing or describing the attributes of things that we're talking about. So let's go through each one of these in, in order. Okay? Now, the way that you use text structures, is it's not, not, not enough just to know about text structures and to be able to identify them, but the key use of this particular idea within teaching is understanding, once you've identified the particular text structure, which is in front of you, then matching that with a graphic organiser. Because the graphic organiser is the tool that students are going to use to unpack and truly understand the piece of text that they're looking at. Now the other reason why we do this is because 80% 80, 80 of the science classes that you will teach will be content lessons. So this is going to be part of your bread and butter everyday activity as a science teacher. And then you'll also do practicals as well. Okay? So how do we use text structures? So there are four easy steps when it comes to using text structures. The first thing is to identify the concept. This is usually in your learning objective. So is it about the characteristics of the birds? Is it about the types of chemical reactions? Is it about Newton's three laws? Whatever it is. Okay? Once you've identified the concept that you're required to teach, read your learning objective, then you select a piece of the, the, then you select the text. And we are broadening the definition of text here to include any kind of communication between two or more people. So for example, that might be a YouTube clip, that might be a textbook, that might be a website. It can be a whole range of things. So we're not just thinking about text as words on a page, but as pieces of communication to convey ideas. Once you've selected your text, then it's your job as a teacher to determine the structure that is being used. Is it cause and effect? Is it list described? Is it compare and contrast? Whatever. Identify the text, the structure of the text. Once you've done that, then you select the corresponding graphic organizer. And you can see the graphic organizers shown here. Now these are just a couple of examples of different types of graphic organizers that you can use to help you and your students unpack text. So for example, compare and contrast is generally done with a Venn diagram, but there are other methods. Using these particular type of graphic organizers are a great, great way to get started. And with practice, you'll get better at picking and modifying particular types of graphic organizers. Okay? Then once you've picked the particular graphic organizer, you should have a go at using it on the text to unpack information. That way you actually then know if the activity will actually work and you'll also have the answers just in case you have a, a brain aneurysm during the lesson and you forget what you're gonna be talking about. So let's go through each one of the text structures now and the corresponding, well, and a corresponding graphic organizer that you can use for each. So. When you read a text or when you listen to a piece of text, you'll hear particular words which will indicate to you that it's that particular text structure. And you can see those at the bottom there in terms of the signal words. So text which uses the list describe structure, this is usually a topic, idea, or person, a thing described by listing its features, characteristics, or examples. The graphical organizer that you can see there is broadly categorized as a concept map. Now, we also talk about mind maps, but they're a separate thing and really beyond the scope of this particular lecture. But just know that if you use a concept map like that, 
that will get you on the right track. The next thing is order and sequence. So for example, this is where you are looking at a phenomena uh, within science and that these are events which occur in order. So for example, it might be mitosis, for example. There is a sequence. Or it might be the menstrual cycle, for example. There is a sequence of events, there is a corresponding graphic organiser and there are corresponding signal words for you to find. Cause and effects. This is pieces of text which show the relationship between causes, events, and effects. And we generally use a flow diagram. So here we've got one cause and three effects. And it's also corresponding signal words. As stated earlier, the most common graphic organiser for comparing, contrasting, or looking for similarities and differences is the Venn diagram, where things where the two things which you're comparing have in common go in the middle, and things which are unique to each one of those categories goes on the outside. The last text structure that we can look at is problem solution. So you can see how this is a modified version of the flow diagram that we saw earlier for cause and effect, and it too has signal words. So they are the five text structures that we can use in teaching. Let's now turn our attention to this idea of differentiation and what that means. Okay, So what is it? What does it look like? And why can't we just stream classes and, and just be done with it? Okay? Now, when you look at the literature on streaming or sometimes in the literature it's referred to as ability grouping, when you look at the sum total of human understanding on this particular topic, and we do that by conducting a particular type of study called a meta-analysis. Now, this particular work that I'm referencing here was done by John Hattie. And then, so what John Hattie did was he looked at a total of 14 meta-analyses, so 14 groups of researchers from around the world looked at the whole literature within this area and summarised it. And in effect, what we have is we've combined the sum total of knowledge for 500 studies on this particular concept. Now, when we do that, and then we crunch the numbers, we arrive at a particular st statistic called the effect size. And the effect size is the value that you can see there, 0.12. And on the scale of things, that is quite low. So the closer the number is to zero, the less effective that particular strategy is. And the more positive the number it is, the more effective that number is. So there's a whole range of studies which have been conducted on this and what we know that there's a minimal effect when you stream students rather than having mixed ability classes there seems to be a minimal effect on learning. So having the smart class and then the general class and then the not so smart class as being separate we find that there's very very little difference in terms of ability of those three groups. And when we have a look at equity issues, then the effect is even more negative. Okay? So that's one of the main reasons why education systems on a whole have moved away from streaming students into particular classes and more towards dealing with students as a, as a whole within mixed ability classes. Now the other, so when we have a look at Education Queensland policy documents, the idea of differentiation is baked into policy. What you can see on the screen here is what's known as the school improvement hierarchy. So this diagram shows you the department's view on how to improve teaching and learning over time. So, so it needs to start with uh, on a firm foundation of knowledge in terms of analysing data, promoting a culture of learning. But you can see there, as you progress through, through those lower levels, as you nail those lower level things, the very pinnacle, the very last thing, the very the cherry on top of the, the learning Sunday, which really makes things happen, is differentiation in teaching and learning. So the department fully recognises the importance of differentiation and places it at the pinnacle of learning and teaching, and this is how they, th this is how the department believes 
that we can improve schools is through proceeding through this diagram. So we can differentiate on the basis of a whole variety of things. So for example, we can differentiate on the basis of curriculum. We can you know, deal with different topics. We can differentiate on the basis of pedagogy, whether we use whole class, whether we use individual activities, whether we use whole group activities. And we can differentiate on the basis of assessment, which is going to be the focus within this particular lecture. So let's look at assessment and the role of WILFs or success criteria and criteria sheets. Now when we have a look at assessment, there are three broad categories. There is diagnostic assessment, formative assessment, and finally summative assessment. Now when you read the literature, if you go onto the internet and you Google types of assessment, you'll hear these three types referred to by different names. So for example, you might hear, to, you might hear about them referred to as assessment for learning, which is diagnostic, assessment as learning, which is formative, and assessment of learning, which is summative. And when you have a look at those words, assessment for, that is assessing current understanding of learning in preparation for future learning, which is diagnostic, and that's the kind of thing that your doctor does, is he diagnoses you when you go into uh, his or her surgery for the very first time. Then there's, also then there's also assessment as learning, which is the formative assessment. This is the assessment which occurs during the process of learning. And then once the learning episode ha has been completed, that's when we conduct things called summative assessment. What's the sum total of learning which has occurred within that learning episode, whether that be the lesson, the week, or the unit, year or term, okay? So it can be any one of those. Now, implicit in all of this is truly understanding the concept of the zone of proximal development, which is um, provided there by the abbreviation ZPD or ZPD, if you're American. Now, this is a constructivist idea. And within constructivism, constructivists think of learners as existing on a continuum somewhere between novice learners and expert learners. So it doesn't matter uh, what skill or piece of content, all of us will exist somewhere on this line. So for example, let's take uh, reciting our times table. So some of us will be really good at reciting our times tables. Some of us will not be so good at reciting our times table. Now, if we had the perfect ruler to measure reciting times tables, okay, we would be able to place people somewhere on this line. So for example, some of us will be better than others, some of, them, some of us will be able to recall them instantly, some of us will, be, will really struggle to recall our times tables. There will be people like us and there will be people not like us. And if we stack everyone who is like us into um, a column like this, then, and we looked at a large, large enough sample of people, then what we could do is describe the population by this kind of curve. And this curve is what we commonly know as the bell curve. Okay? Now, where does the concept of the zone of proximal development come in? The zone of proximal development was developed by um, Lev Vygotsky, who was a Russian uh, cognitive scientist, um, psychologist, and what he said was that the most effective teaching is where the teacher pitches the material just beyond what the students are currently capable of doing but, and providing scaffolding so that they can get to that. So when we have a look at, say this was our class and we were doing mathematics or even science, we would find that we could actually split the class into three broad categories. We've got a middle category there, which is the large proportion of students in our class. And then we'll have students up the top end of the class and also students down the bottom end of the class. Okay? So now you might have also heard of the term of teaching to the middle. Okay? So if we combine that idea of teaching to the middle and the zone of proximal development, what we should be doing is setting our criteria, okay, our middle criteria, just beyond. In this system, it's that two star. 
So the two star is what we think the average student should be able to do if they push themselves within this lesson. So we set a criteria just beyond what the majority of students in our class are capable of doing. That's our two star. Then what we do is, well, if students actually try really, really hard, well, they, they can go beyond what we think is, is reasonable. And we're gonna call that a three star effort, or in this case, that's the, that really big push. So if an average student in our class for reciting, time, reciting times tables really, really pushes themselves, then they might be able to achieve a three star. If, however, those, those bunch of students in the middle just kind of coast along, then that's what we call a one star effort. Okay? So that's what they're currently capable of doing. What they're currently capable of doing is the one star. If they push themselves just beyond what they're currently capable of, and yes, we provide the scaffolding, then that's a two star effort. And if they push themselves extra hard, then they can achieve a three star effort. Now, that's all fine and dandy for the vast majority of students in our class. However, that's not the reality of modern teaching because we have students at the upper end, we also have students at the lower end. What do we do with those students? Well, this is where negotiation with those particular students come in. So what you can do now, so if we had a generic criteria such as this for our class, notice how the students, the higher end students, they're already achieving that two star effort. Hell, some of them are already achieving the three star effort. That's no good for them because to them, what is a hard push for everybody else, they're already able to do. They can just sit back and coast. And that, quite, that happens quite a lot with our high end students. Because they're already able to do the work, they can just sit back and take it easy while everybody else has to work really hard. When we look at the other side of the equation, the lower ability students in our class, even that one star effort, that's beyond what they're currently capable of doing. What is coasting for everybody else is a push for those students. So this is where negotiation really comes into play here. So what we can do now, because this is formative assessment, because it doesn't count towards report cards and OPs and, and things like that, because this is a formative assessment, this is this type of assessment you do in class day in, day out as part of the learning process, you're able to negotiate and you're able to change things up and tailor and differentiate the learning to the particular students within your class. So for your lower end students, what you can do is have them negotiate. So they would come up to you and say, oh sir, that one star, that's really a, that, that's really, that's me really pushing myself. Do you mind if I make that my two star and I create a new one star? Okay. So the students there are negotiating to scaffold down or differentiate for themselves the criteria for everybody, for themselves within the class. On the other end of the scale, you'd have your higher end students also negotiating with you because remember, what's a push for everybody else is them coasting. So they would come up and say, and say, oh man, you know, three star, I can already do three stars. How about I negotiate to do X, Y, and Z, okay? And so what you're doing there is you're encouraging that dialogue back from the students. You're encouraging students to self-assess. So here's a good example of that three star system in action. So remember, this is formative assessment. This is the assessment as part of learning during the, during the lessons. So for example, so you can see there, by the end of the lesson, I have noticed how it's written from the perspective of the student. That's highly important because the WILFs or the success criteria are for the students. They're written for the students for them to use. Okay? And you can see there some good examples of that ramping up of what's required in the particular task. So they, they are two separate tasks. One is for maths and the one below is for science. And hopefully you can see how the scaffold how they have been scaffolded. What's particularly important for you to notice is that in the science example, the, the second example that you can see there, 
the one star is pretty much, well, is exactly the same as the two star, however, it's with assistance. So remember how we were talking earlier about the zone of proximal development is what the students, are, um, you set the bar just beyond what the students are capable of doing with structure, with scaffolding. So the graphic organizers that you're determining by looking at non-fiction text structures, that's a scaffold, but also you are a scaffold yourself. You are a learning tool that the students can tap into and utilize during the lessons. So for a one star student, so it's quite possible for you to write blah, 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 blah with assistance. Okay, rightio. So let's look at the advantages of using this three star system in formative assessment, in assessment that you do in class as part of the learning process. Okay? So the beauty of this system is that it's highly student-centered. What do we mean by student-centered? Well, it's encouraging students to self-reflect and self-assess because what we want them to be able to do is to be able to take that skill of self-evaluation with them through the rest of their lives. We will also want to encourage students to goal set. So once you write or once you display the success criteria, you should be encouraging students to, to try and push themselves beyond what they're currently capable of doing. The other great thing is that it facilitates conversations between you and students. Okay? So you can see how in the support students and higher end students, how we're encouraging those particular students to come and talk to you, to negotiate differentiated criteria for them. This is a really great way to foster that two-way dialogue between you and your students. And also, it's really encouraging that independence, that um, self-assuredness to be able to approach the teacher, to be able to modify things so that they suit their needs. And then when and then to really take this idea to the next level, pair this with the growth mindset. So once again, this is another idea which is kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but do go ahead and look up that idea of the growth mindset because it's a really, really powerful idea for you to use and employ as a teacher. Okay? So now it's your turn. So you've written a learning objective, you've written the corresponding success criteria, now have a go at writing the three star criteria for your success criteria. So refer back to the example in the slides if you need to. So let's have a look at what we've covered in this particular lecture. You should be able to identify the key parts of a lesson plan. You should be able to construct not only success criteria, but also the corresponding learning objective. And also we've looked at how we can differentiate that in terms of the three star system. And that's how we differentiate the success criteria. In terms of planning lessons, we looked at how we looked at the importance of being able to identify the non-fiction text structure and then pairing that with a particular graphic organiser because we want to foster active learning in our classroom. And also, if you want to have a go at it, is to try that last learning objective. Try summarising a given piece of text using the correct pictorial representation of that text structure.